Tracy, the Jellyfish Queen, and today I'm going to be doing a video talking about very simple things that you can do to be a better Magic player. These are not groundbreaking rocket science ideas. They're really simple things that you can do that are going to help you. Um, I notice a lot that when I used to play competitive Magic, I felt like it was always a thing where you could really tell who was new. I mean, I think that's like in a lot of environments you can you can tell, and I feel like some people try to take advantage of that and think that's an easy win. And, you know, some new players can get really self-conscious and can get really, you know, anxiety around events, even like events at your local game store because you feel like, you know, you're going to make misplays or things like that. But these are your tips for beginners on things that I think can really help you out. So the first thing is put a dice or put something on top of your library to forget your triggers. I feel like some people think that this is a very weak thing to do. Like if you do this, you must be terrible because you can't remember your freaking trigger and I'm here to tell you that it doesn't make you look bad what makes you look bad is if you miss your trigger so if you can prevent that like missing triggers is a hundred percent preventable if you just put something on your on your um, the top of your library it doesn't have to be a dice but I feel like a dice is like probably the most common thing that you can use you put like a coin or like whatever you want just put something on the top of your deck do not miss your triggers just don't do it it's easily avoidable. I notice a lot of times it is with like packed triggers, like summoners packed, slaughter packed, any ETB triggers <clears throat> that you have, you just don't want to miss those. Seriously. Put something on the top of your deck. It doesn't make you look weak. Just do it. Second thing is, okay, so a lot of times what I've, what I've noticed in new magic players and what they typically do so you, know, you have your first main and your second main phase, right? And so a lot of times what people will do is, like, they'll play stuff during their first main phase that doesn't really affect combat. Like, they'll play these creatures and it doesn't really do anything to combat. You move to combat regardless and you attack with these other creatures. I'm not talking about cards that have haste, that's totally different. I'm talking about cards that don't influence what's going on with combat. You're attacking regardless of what you play before. A lot of times you don't want to play things on your second main phase. Again, I'm not talking about cards that have like haste or something like that that affect you. I'm talking about cards that have no influence on combat. So what you want to do is you don't want to play a lot of cards during your first main phase that you don't need to and save them for your second main phase because you can totally trick your opponent into thinking that um, you have a combat trick. I notice this all the time and it's kind of funny that I kind of translate this into EDH, even though how I play EDH right now is totally really not competitive at all. Um, but I notice that I do this all the time. I notice that I'm like, okay, I'm saving this for my main phase that uh, my opponent, which is mainly my friend Paul, um, thinks that I have something, thinks that I have some sweet combat trick. Another thing too is depending on what your opponent does can influence what you do. So say for example your opponent instant speed board wipes like at your um during your turn you're like well damn I feel really bad that during my first main phase I actually played a creature because I could have played that second main phase where it wouldn't have gotten destroyed. So basically a lot of times you don't want to play things during your first main phase. Stick to your second main phase. The third thing I want to say is oh okay this actually this this little thing actually inspired this video. This is why I wanted to film this video. So, say for example, you're playing against, I don't know, like, Scape Shift deck or something like that. That's one of the decks that I can think of in Modern that has um, a tutor, which would be um, Bring to Light. I was going to say Scape Shift. That's not a tutor. Uh, well, yeah, I guess Scape Shift is a tutor, but that doesn't count for the purpose of this tip. Um, so a lot of times when someone plays something like Bring to Light, you're like, oh my gosh, it's a tutor. I need to counter it, right? Don't counter the tutor unless you know your opponent is going to get something that can't be countered. Counter the actual thing that they play. Because what can happen is your opponent taps for, say your opponent has enough mana for the tutor and then the, to cast the tutor and to play the tutor. What you can do is you let them get their tutor and then counter the thing that you get, that they get from the tutor. Because one, maybe it's not that good in that situation. Maybe it's something that you're like, I have another answer in my hand for, like destroy target creature or something like that, that I don't want to waste this counter spell on. That's the thing, counter spells are very fragile, especially in modern. There's I did a whole video talking about how bad counter spells are in modern if you want to check that out. But basically there's not a lot of good counter spells that are like, you know, they're very specific a lot of times. So it's counter target non-creature spell, counter target creature spell, things like that. So you want to make sure you have um, you know, you're saving your counter spells for the best of the best. Don't counter their tutor. A lot of times just counter the thing that they tutor for. Okay, good. Awesome. Uh, number four is don't board wipe unless you have to. I know I had this major issue when I play control decks because I have like so much removal at my hands that I'm like removal happy and I'm always like, 
Well, duh, Supreme Verdicts. Like, of course I want to get rid of your stuff, right? But honestly, if you're not in a very threatening position, don't board wipe unless you have to. If you can, like, withstand a couple of smacks from your opponent and you've got other ways of removing their stuff, you know, don't board wipe unless you absolutely need to. If they got one creature on the board that's not really threatening, don't board wipe. Wait until they have, like, five when you're like, oh, okay, uh, yeah, I can't do anything about that. All right, number five. Um, analyze every aspect of the board. And I'm gonna, and this sounds like a really simple thing, like, duh, analyze everything. But I have to say, and this is the part that I'm tacking onto this tip, especially in a stale board state. So a lot of times I've noticed what happens. I remember I was watching one of my friends um, play against, uh, he was playing Bloom Titan, and I cannot remember what his opponent was playing. Um, I don't remember. But his opponent, he was playing some control deck, whatever, and kind of like a more well-known Magic player. I don't remember who it was at the time. And this well-known Magic player honestly could have totally won the game. It's one of those things that when you're watching, you see it, but when you're playing, you don't. So he was like, he made this total misplay. He didn't analyze every aspect of the board. It was a very stall board state and he lost because he misplayed and given misplays totally happen and we're all guilty of them. No one is perfect. Don't be like, I never misplay. Shut up. Yeah, you do. Um, so um, but yeah, what, what he did is he, he wasn't analyzing every aspect of the board, and again, it was in a stall board state, because a lot of times what can happen in a stall board state is you're like, uh, sorry, a stale board state, is you're like, well, nothing's going on, I can't do anything. This happened to me, and this actually cost me moving up in my first ever PPTQ. I had a Windburst Kite, and I forgot about it. I didn't analyze, it was a stale part, part of the game a little bit, and um, I forgot to flip my Windburst Kite, so it was a sore and solemn visitor, and I lost the game because I wasn't paying attention. Attention. Given it was my first PPTQ, I was just getting into modern. Um, so, I mean, mistake, it happened, whatever. But yeah, um, definitely look at every single aspect. Look at your land base, which I think is another one of my things. Um, okay, well, that's actually a point. We're going to go back to that point later on. Okay, number six. This is a major thing that I do, and I do this for a couple of reasons. So if you're like me, you really like to take your magic cards and shuffle your magic cards. It's just a habit. We all not all of us, but a lot of us do it, and we really like it, and I hate when I don't have cards in my hand. I hate when I don't have cards in my hand because one, I can't shuffle them, and two, because it makes me look weak, and it makes me look like I have no action going on in my hand. So say you're in later stages of the game, and you're drawing nothing but like 15 lands in a row. We all know that feel. It's all happened to us, right? And the natural instinct is get those lands down and play them. Okay, honey, when do you really need like 25 lands on the board. Guess what? You don't. So what you should do is keep some of those lands in your hand because it tricks your opponent. It says, oh, they've got a lot of cards in their hand. They probably have a lot of answers. And then a lot of times what'll happen is, is like your opponent will like play a creature and you're like, okay, whatever, because you don't have an answer for it, but you can totally trick them into thinking, ha, huh, Supreme Verdict is coming up later on. Ha ha ha. And then you, okay, like a lot of their creatures. And then you're like, totally have Supreme Verdict. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number seven, um, don't send them cues via body language. This is something that I notice so many new magic players fail at, and it's something that I think you really have to try to do. And I'm not saying that you have to be amazing at poker and put on your poker face. I mean, you kind of have to, though. Um, again, you could be in a situation where you literally draw 15 lanes in a row, and if you make verbal cues like, <sighs> Oh my gosh, things like that. That gives your opponent clues that you're not drawing well. And your opponent says, huh, they clearly don't have anything going on. And then they proceed to kill you. So put on your poker face a little bit and try to fool them into thinking that you're drawing some juice. Do not give them free clues. This is something that I think a lot of people do and you just it drives me nuts when I see it because it's totally pre preventable. Don't give them any sort of cue of cl yeah, clues and cues. Um, don't do anything like that. So body language is another thing too. Like um, I feel like if you're kind of like, I don't know if it's like slumped, like pulled over, but I don't know, just kind of like Oh, like you when you're not drawing well, you can kind of like slump down and whatever. It's the little things like that is people who are paying attention, you know, pay att paying attention to your opponent and seeing like what they're doing. Don't give them clues. But also too, on the second token of that is pay attention to what your opponent's doing because they may give you free body language that you want to take advantage of. So my next point, I actually really don't understand my writing. So we're just going to trudge through this point. Number eight. Um, I wrote like don't be a yes man. And kind of what I mean by that is 
when your opponent does something, actually think about it and don't just like, I think a lot of times what people will do, and this like really bothers me, especially people who I feel like are trying to be really elitist. Like I know everything in magic and I'm so good at this game. Like they won't even look at you. I'll be like, oh, I'll play this wood elves or something like that. And they're like, uh-huh. Yeah, whatever. Like they don't even like care. They're like so apathetic to everything. Um, but people who like you do whatever and they just don't care like understand what your opponent is doing because you may have like all the answers or you may think you have all the answers but actually see what your opponent is doing a thing i think a lot of times that happens is in control strategies i think this is actually the point that i was trying to make here is say you're playing a control deck a lot of times against a control deck i think what happens a lot of times is like if you're playing against a control deck you kind of want to just dump your hand but you have to understand that your opponent is reacting to what you're doing so you have to like play pretty slowly if you're playing against a control strategy because like you may be like oh i'm gonna play this and then i'm also gonna play this and then your opponent is like hold up i didn't okay the first thing that you did so you have to like slow down when you play um and just make sure that everything you know that you're okaying everything that your opponent has done. I hope this makes sense. I feel like this made sense when I wrote it and it doesn't make sense when I'm saying it. Okay. Um, the point that I want to go back to later, point number nine, is use your man lands. Okay, and don't forget about them. And so I'm talking about like man lands here, things that like can attack your opponent. Um, Celestial Colonnade, oh, love that card. Um, Creeping Tar Pit, that's another really good one. Um, and things like Windbrus Kites that you hideaway lands that you put stuff under and then we have whatever amount of power or creatures or things you can activate them. Cards are really sweet, right? So don't forget about your man lands. Again, it's super easy in like board states that nothing is going on that you can forget about your man lands, but don't forget about them. They're there for a reason and they're there to help you out, so make sure you use them. And number 10, this is kind of the sort of like cliche, I guess, sort of thing. Um, that I think you guys actually had like a lot of stuff to say when I talked about how I don't like watching coverage is don't feel compelled to like actually sit there and be like, let me force myself to watch coverage if it makes you want to like, you know, break someone's hand. Like don't do that if you know you're not going to get anything out of it. Play. Play a lot of magic so that you can get better. Um, don't watch coverage. Don't force yourself to watch coverage if you know it's not going to help you. I really do believe this is like, a, you know, I graduated with an education degree and we talk a lot about education. Of course, that's like literally all my classes were was like education and English classes. And, you know, and one of the things we, we talked about are like major things that we talked about, like every single class were like the three major thing, like ways of learning. One is like hearing auditory, like me talking to you. If you're learning from this, you're an auditory learner. Um, two would be like visual. If I were to like show cards to you and then talk about them, that means you're a visual learner. And then kinesthetic means that you actually have to like do the activity to understand it. I'm someone like that. I'm totally a kinesthetic learner. Like if you're telling me how to do something, I'm probably not going to understand it. I actually have to do it physically myself. Um, so yeah, if you're someone like that, if you're most people, I feel like most magic players, I feel like ten I tend to notice are kinesthetic learners. They learn the best when they themselves are the ones playing. So play a lot. Take notes if you need to. Um, I feel like that's a really good prime example of a good magic player is that they take notes after the matches with what cards worked, what didn't, what sideboard cards to take in, take out, that whole, that whole sort of thing. So... Hey guys, that was it. Those were very simple bare bones things to make you a better magic player. And uh, leave me comments below and what you think are good ways to make you a better magic player. And I'll talk to you guys later. Bye!